Uh, thank you for coming to the Marines Memorial. This is a living memorial to honor all of those that have served and to educate the public on that service. Well, good evening. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you, General Myatt. Uh, thank you, the Marine Memorial Association. My name is Lieutenant Commander Josh Welly, and I'm an active duty naval officer and the lead on this important book called In the Shadow of Greatness. I'm joined by my co-authors, Lieutenant Commander John Cawthon, who's a pilot and uh, is stationed in the area. My co-author, Rachel Torres, whose brother was a member of my class and you'll hear about tonight. And I'm honored to share with you an important story, not just for our great Navy and Marine Corps, but for the country so that they understand what leadership meant for a, a generation after 9-11. So you have to understand that this book was written with great humility. The co-editors, Graham Plaster and John Ennis and Kate Krantz, we were all a core team and we led a larger body of writers, people who struggled to write to find their voice. He was a company mate, and I called him one day, and I knew he was a casualty evacuation pilot. So in Iraq and Afghanistan, our generals cared a lot about the time a wounded warrior would be evacuated by these CH-46s. So I called Rocky. I said, Rocky, um, I'd love you to write this book. Would you do it? He said, Josh, come on. I'm a Navy linebacker. I did very poorly in English. I can't write for this book. I said, Rocky, we're a team, a team of editors, and we're going to get you there. Please give us 3,000 words. So he submitted 6,000. I said, Rocky, you're a Marine. I thought you followed directions. <laughs> and he said, oh, I just have so much to say. So much of what it meant to fly into harm's way and pull these Iraqis, these Army soldiers, these Marines, these sailors out of harm's way. So I want to share a quick paragraph from Rocky's story. It's called Evacuated the Injured from Rocky Checa. I distinctly remember evacuating a Navy SEAL on my second deployment in 2006 from Combat Outpost Ramadi. He was the first SEAL killed in action in Iraq. One of his fellow SEALs came with him on the flight when he, when he picked him up. He had a severe gunshot wound to the head and face, but was alive during the transit. He succumbed to his injuries after we dropped him off, and it became quite clear to me very early on that no one was invincible here, not even a SEAL. Dan and September of 2009, lost both of his legs in turnover with another SEAL unit in Marja. Marja is in Helmand, Afghanistan, in the southern region. He was only there for a week, and he, lost, he stepped on a pressure point IED, and he lost both of his legs. His sister and his mom quit their job, moved to Bethesda to nurse him back to health. Within two years, he ran the New York Marathon in less than three hours. On his prosthetics, he is now training for the 2015 Olympics in Colorado. We acknowledge him in the conclusion. We talk about the integrity of these 16 SEALs who did not write for the book for respect for their great community. And we, we, we're just honored, and we turn to Dan as a hero in our class. And, and so Andrew's obviously, he's my brother. He's, you know, I'm his little sister. He's a great guy, but he's not exceptional, right, for the Academy. Like, this is the, the quality of of cleverness and desire to serve that, you know, is emblematic of, of all these graduates. And in his senior year, Andrew was diagnosed with cancer. And he had the cancer removed from his liver, and he got really sick, and he was recovering, and, and he decided he did want to graduate with his class and, and worked his butt off and, and graduated in 2002. And he was commissioned as a Marine officer. Managed to graduate, managed to get his commission, and he, he did die in 2004 from, from cancer. And you ask yourself, like, like obviously that's terrible, right? It's, it shouldn't happen to anyone. So what's, the, what's next? What's the legacy you leave behind? For me, I take a lot of solace and inspiration from how my brother lived his last years, his last days, and, and his whole life. So let me read to you a little bit more from the book, from Andrew's chapter, which appears in the Leadership Laboratory Fleet Tested section. Classmate Ryan O'Connell remembers, Andrew never said anything about the battle he was fighting. Our conversations were always about his life, that he was living seemingly despite cancer, and never centered on his cancer or pain. So for Andrew, you know, these tumors, they would disappear for a while, they would come back, there would be more surgeries, more treatments, new side effects. 
And in December 2003, a gunnery sergeant told Andrew, sir, you need to get your house in order. As things got worse, a high school friend asked Andrew, this is really important, a high school friend asked Andrew, if you knew it would turn out this way, would you still have gone to the academy? Yes, Andrew said, for the friendships. And when his illness ambushed him a second time, Andrew accepted the fact that this was not a battle he could win, and it was here that he showed a special form of leadership rooted in courage and compassion. And he had the courage to face reality, and even as he hung on with all his dwindling strength, to say fearlessly, I am dying. And at the same time, he was reaching out to say farewell and try to comfort all his family, all his friends that he could reach. And what you'll read in, in, in The Shadow of Greatness is that people end up serving and sacrificing in ways they didn't expect. You go to the academy, you major in one thing, you want to be a pilot, you don't get to be a pilot, you get you know, individually augmented to an army unit. Things change. And these grads, they adapt. And for Andrew, he did experimental treatments that today are so effective compared to other treatments they're so effective at saving lives that there's a billboard for one of them on the 101. It's a marketing tool. That's how good it is. And Andrew's sacrifice, Andrew going through those treatments, is part of his legacy. And now this book is part of his legacy. Another element of this, in keeping with that theme in this very part of the book, is a gentleman by the name of Dave Augustine, submarine officer. The amazing thing about a submarine officer, if anybody has ever been, been friends with one, is you realize that they disappear from the very beginning to a deep, dark place, and they never emerge. They're responsible for turning valves, pushing buttons, and making sure that the submarine does not disappear, because essentially, that cargo, not just the personnel, but the nuclear missiles and the reactor itself, is extremely important and vital and potentially dangerous. Dave Augustine, he served with distinction, but then again, like others, volunteered outside of his warfare uh, specialty to be a UN peacekeeper. I will tell you right now, from the day I graduated, the last thing I would have ever expected any of my classmates to do, branching off from their specialties, surface, submarine, aviation, would be to volunteer and go to a place like Liberia to do just like Matt Freeman did, to do just like Courtney Sanini did, to offer hope, sucker, and all of the power that comes with that soft power that the United States can bring, the influence, the material well-being, and the ideas. Dave Augustine did this, and he did it with great distinction. We steamed to Indonesia, and the entire time, I couldn't, think to, I couldn't think straight about why we were doing this when we were in the midst of a war, Afghanistan, Iraq. Here was a carrier strike group, the most awesome assemblage of power on the face of the planet. And we were going to an unknown region to help people because they were in distress. It made no sense to me. Once we got there, I fully understood the implications of this. And that's when I realized that there was more to the United States military, that there was more to the United States Navy and the Marine Corps than just that so-called hard power. This soft power, this display of beneficence goes along with the flag, the gray hull, and that power that you can project through aircraft, ordnance, missiles, et cetera, et cetera. It was really driven home to me because I was on the first flight in country, and when we went feet dry crossing that shoreline, the shoreline had been completely transformed. Which what, what was once lush jungle, rice paddies had been completely devastated and savaged by probably what amounted to a 100-foot wave. And if anyone can imagine the awesome power of water, especially as it's translated into a 100-foot wave, you can well imagine what this water did to the coastline of Sumatra. You get an idea here in the picture. 
where there was once a village and now we are landing on the road that went through the village. There are no houses, there are no structures. That was all of Indonesia. At the end of the day, the estimated body count just in Indonesia was roughly 200,000 people. The four people that I remember most embodying what we were doing, maturing me, giving me a greater perspective on what it was that the military does, were those four gentlemen down there. It's estimated that they were down, cut off, on an island that was created by the wave. What was once coastline had now become an island. They were there for seven to 10 days. Once they came up to the aircraft, we realized, and I saw it in their eyes, the anguish, the suffering, the devastation of what, that, what they had experienced. And when the corpsman evaluated them, they were so dehydrated, I will never forget, he pulled up the skin on the top of their hand, and it stuck straight up and stayed there because they had barely any fluid in their body and the skin slowly settled. We tried to give them food and water and the corpsman had to stop us because they were so dehydrated we could have killed them. I'll never forget those eyes. They stick in my mind even to this day. And when Josh asked me to write this book, I'd kind of forgotten, maybe not forgotten, but at least shuddered away what I saw in Indonesia. And this really brought it home. And in some ways, it was actually a good experience, and it really made me realize, along with my other classmates, how important this endeavor was to highlight exactly what it is today's junior officers are going through and what they've done and what tomorrow's junior officers will do. And I think that's extremely important. Andrew was a remarkable person, blessed early on with a clear sense of self and clear sense of purpose. In a world in which so many people transit youth and even middle age while searching for their calling, and purpose, Andrew focused clearly on what he wanted. He wanted to be an Annapolis graduate and a proud Marine, and that is what he became. And when he was knocked down and fatally wounded by his illness, he fought back valiantly, and like the leader that he was, he marched towards his goal as long as his strength remained. And so we're all very proud to be able to present this plaque and something, maybe something you can hang in Andrew's bedroom in your home. <laughs>